when Jens invited me to this uh, interesting summit, I had to go and look at the, the website of the summit and I noticed that it says, please don't say anything obvious <laughs> on the website, which uh, I tried to, in compilation of my presentation, not to say the obvious things, obvious things in the sense that everybody knows about. And probably most of the things I'm going to say is in common with what has been said already with, uh, by Chilin and Jens. But I would like to propose a number of new ideas that could be taken up by the researchers and take this one further. And um, the title is Internet on the Move. That is not internet or broadband access in hotspots, but in a ubiquitous manner. And capacity crunch. Uh, you guys know the importance of broadband to uh, competitiveness of an, a country's economy. And that shows the correlation between the number of broadband is not necessarily wireless broadband is uh, fixed as well. And, and its uh, relationship with the competitiveness of a country's economy. It's been said by reliable sources that an increase of 10 additional broadband lines per every 100 inhabitants or individuals in the US, which is 10% increase with 30 million new lines it would contribute about 100 billion GD uh, contribution to the US GDP. 50% of the economic growth in European Union is from ICT, so information as well as communication technologies. And to, and bravely some people have said that broadband communication could be the solution to the, our problem, economic problem that we are facing not only for the broadband and telecom business, but because uh, the other industry that is using the ICT and broadband communication in order to run the, con uh, to run the business. In the UK, for example, but it's been recorded that 10 to 12 percent of GDP is co directly comes from the ICT side, but 20 percent is from other industry that uses the ICT. So clearly, and that's why we have this summit as well, the broadband is very important to us. And you've seen these figures. I mentioned this one uh, that 1,000 times as a capacity crunch or problem was first mentioned by Dokoma and Huawei in a white paper I was compiling in the um, expert group uh, for Europe. And there was a number of solutions. People say in order to meet this 1,000 times, we go 10 by 10 by 10, or 2 times 50 times 10, or whatever. It was different combination of this in order to reach that one. But they say this 1,000 times is by 2020. Are we designing future system? for 2020, which is seven years away? Or are we designing the system for something that at least stays with us for the next 20 years? If we go for the next 20 years, and if we believe in this projection of the traffic growth of doubling every 12 months, then we need to design the system to at least to stay with us until 2030. So that means one million times. So to the power of 20, not to the power of 10. So that's one point that we need to take into account if we design the new system, which we call it 5G. So I think Jens uh, mentioned about killer application. That was the main justification for uh, 2G, 3G, 4G, etc. The killer application, I would like to just um, mention that everything on the internet is a killer application. So internet itself is a killer application. Rather than just individual voice or data or video or whatever it is. 
So what is happening to the content of the internet? There has been a huge complexity increase in the content of the services that we have on the internet. Web pages are very complex and they have tripled the website, web pages in the last five, six years. 75% of HTTP requests has been increased by 20% in the since 2003. 90% of web pages have image and video content. So the, the content itself are increasing complexity. And it was uh, mentioned that 6 billion mobile subscription, I think 6 billion is a SIM card, right? And 6 billion mobile phones. 200 million smartphones sold every quarter. And all the way, these all gigantic numbers. The interesting one is the one at the bottom, which I was, it was surprised to me, 200,000 tweets every minute. This is an average case. I don't know whether you heard when there was a, one of the famous football clubs in the uh, UK, the manager uh, retired. In the first four hours, there was 1.7 million tweets, <laughs> only in, in, in the in UK. For this huge increase in traffic demand, some people, some analysts gone as far as saying that 2014 is a doomsday end of profit for many operators. So I studied this figure, the analysts, quite a lot, and assume that the traffic growth is correct, because we cannot do this. And I wanted to verify where, is we, where we are with the capacity. Where are gonna these two going to cross each other? So we did a huge amount of simulation studies for LTE release 10 with different bandwidth and different cell size. Cell size of, where is that, uh, 300 meter which is, it is the inter-site distance, which is about 150 meter cell size, to 100 meter, all the way to 25 meter cell radius. And look at the traffic, 1,000 times the traffic growth. As Jens mentioned, it is not uniformly across all the environments. Look at the cases like working population in a cities, Offices, peak and mean and average values of this traffic distribution. The example we used is UK population. And we used um, the spectrum available for mobile in UK as well. And we concentrated on, on London. Uh, which this results is extendable to most of the capital cities in Western European countries as well as Beijing, Tokyo, New York, and etc. So looking at this and different colors, I think the case A, which is a traffic working population in a city, that's a traffic growth. And this is capacity provided by different cell dimensions. The top one is the cell dimension of 25 meter, cells of 25 meters. And this is the cell of, I would say, I can't remember what it was, uh, 100 meter, no, that's 50 meter radius, that's 25 meter there. So as you can see, the capacity, and we draw a straight line, hits the, the demand, most of them well below 2020. Then people say, Yes, but Wi-Fi is there, it's going to save us. We do a lot of offloading. And we look at the percentage of the Wi-Fi deploy, uh, deployment per cell area, 25% and 6% and etc. You see the effect of that on the, 
on the traffic relief uh, from the cellular systems. There is one thing that we need to take into uh, to, uh, to note that most of the today's Wi-Fi deployment is indoor. There's not many outdoor Wi-Fi's. The traffic, the busy traffic of the indoor, the busy traffic hour, does not coincide with the busy traffic of outdoor. So we cannot simply say Wi-Fi indoor will take away all this traffic load from, from the outdoor. As you can see, with the 6% density of the Wi-Fi and 20%, 25%, this is the effect the Wi-Fi has. It's very small. So most of the Wi-Fi, uh, by the way, I have to say it is 11G Wi-Fi. We have model 11N as well as 11AC Wi-Fi. Most of the Wi-Fi is short-term solution. It's not a long-term solution, Wi-Fi, as it is. We look at different scenarios. We look at which we are going to publish these results very, very soon. And uh, I look at different spectrum allocation, spectrum lo location. But what is important for you to note is this, this metric, gigabits per second per area, per meter squared or kilometer squared. I know we've been talking about spectral efficiency quite a lot, but what is important, you don't sell, operators do not sell a spectrum efficiency. What you sell is capacity or area spectral efficiency. How much capacity you have per meter squared. And that is important. So looking at the UK scenario, obviously we don't need this capacity everywhere. Look at the dense urban environment. Look at 2015, 2020, with a modest increase in busy hour utilization from 15% to 20%. So we need 2.8 gigabits per second per kilometer squared in UK, 2015. 2020, we need 53 gigabits per second per meter square. That means 19 times more. If you don't believe in these figures of the traffic doubling every year, every 12 months, and etc., cetera, etc., cetera, let's slash this 19 times by 10 times to 10 times. Slash it to five times. Slash it to three times. The way that we have developed 2G, 3G, 4G, effectively, if we are honest with ourselves, we're going for the higher speed and higher bandwidth. More spectrum. In terms of the area capacity for the same cell size, we haven't really done a major breakthrough in the technology. We cannot have 10 times, 5 times, 3 times more spectrum. But there is not. It's not available. I know Jen said we have 1 gigahertz of bandwidth. At the moment, the mobile spectrum is 500 megahertz allocated. The best we will have is 1 gigahertz. WRC 15, 16. So, the way we approach the, the new system, if you want to call it 5G, it has to be very different to the way that we have approached 3G and 4G. It's not by simply increasing the bandwidth for a higher speed. So, if we get and believe in this trend of the generation games, that every system stays with us for 20 years before they peak. And then about 10 to 12 years before that, we need to do research and the standardization. That means we are already one year late for 5G. 
because 2011 was the year to start researching on 5G. But another thing to observe in here is the gap between the standards. 12 years, 10 years, 8 years, I believe the 5G will be less than 7 years. So it is not such a long term solution or standards. That is because the, tr the demand and people using the internet and the da mobile data. So, what is the problem? Let's summarize. It's mobile data traffic doubling every tw 12 months. The capacity, area spectral capacity, is doubling every 10 years. That means every generation. So we are facing a spectrum crunch, or capacity crunch, if you want. So people say, what is 5G? 5G is not a technology that you can put it on top of the 4G. It has to have very different distinguishing feature in order to make it 5G. And it, has not, it should not be the technology that would fit in with LTE B and LTE C. So it's more about sustainability of the mobile business, addressing mobile business op uh, operators' business. In the first instant, is solving the capacity crunch. Second priority is the network operation energy. I think Chile meant, uh, very well explained the importance of the energy. The third one is the cost of the network. I believe the last one is to increase the data rate. And not in the sense of yet by two numbers as Chile Chilin mentioned what, uh, 100 megabits per second and 1 gigabits per second. Therefore, we have a new generation of systems. But it is to decrease the gap between the data available on a fix and the mobile data. That is the only way I can see good justification for increasing the data rate. In my opinion, 4G provides a very decent data rate. Our eyes and ears the bandwidth is not bigger than 100 megabits per second and 1 gigabits per second. How, how much the resolution of uh, high-definition TV do we want to see? Beyond that, we cannot see the, the difference between that. Anyway, I prepared this one for because some journalists, they contacted me and said, they asked this question, and I said to myself, we never, as engineers, we never ask ourselves. <laughs> These sort of questions. So, what happens if you don't have 5G? I so said, from the consumer's point of view, it is like you are in a train station, those who have been in a Waterloo station in the UK, in London, and everything is being served by Wi Fi. How patchy that, if that uh, service availability it is. And we will have that sort of patchiness in the service availability using the cellular system. And that is not something that mobile operators are used to. Mobile operators always provided a good quality of experience to their customers in terms of service availability. And they cannot go down that route of the what Wi-Fi today in the multi-cell and multi-user contiguous coverage of Wi-Fi provides. So, one thing I mentioned about the rate, believe it or not, GSM in its own time was the most advanced uh, technology available, provided higher data rate than the fixed it, 9.6 kilobits per second compared to 4.8. Since then, the gap between what is available on the mobile and what is available on the fixed has widened. So what we need to do, because that's originally what mobile networks were about, to have a seamless experience of what you get on the fixed network with added mobility. Unfortunately, we have taken our eyes off what is available on the fix, and the gap has increased wider and wider and wider. So what we need to do, we need to reduce the gap 
in order to get that experience of the fixed network. So, is the solution to capacity crunch, is it only radio-based technologies? I don't think so. It is two ways that we need to handle this. What is, I call it, generic data handling. The way that we handle the data on the fixed network, the way that we distribute the data, the content, is very important. And we need to understand the context of the user before we uh, deliver the data to the user. The second one, which goes in parallel, is efficient use of the radio spectrum. That is area spectral efficiency as well as energy efficiency side. Both of them together. So, this is a, seems to be a very sensitive question. Do we need another air interface? I believe that we do, not for the same reason as we did for 3G and 4G. The reason is, in terms of the spectral efficiency, link spectral efficiency, um, even with that MIMO, we have reached the capacity limit, Shannon capacity limit, 10, 20% here and there. That's, the, that's where we are. So the objective is not higher spectral efficiency. The best we can do is 20%. That's all. So area spectral efficiency and energy efficiency is important. 4G OFDMA, as it is, was not designed for small cells. Now we are trying to scale it down and say it works for the small cell. In terms of the signaling and management overhead of the OFDMA, that's horrendous. If we believe in 10 times, or some people say 50 times, or some people say 100 times more densification of the cells, that's a nightmare scenario. So the justification of the new air interface or new waveform, it could be OFTM, but it has to be something that it can be locally organized, as Misha said, self-organized. Put it very simple that way. We need to have minimum network management and uh, control overhead signaling. We need to have sub-millisecond air interface latencies. We need to have flexible, this is very important, especially when we look at highly fragmented spectrum that we have. OFDMA is not suitable for carrier aggregation. Uh, I was talking to one test equipment provider. They said from the spectrum aggregation, carrier aggregation, which is in release uh, 12 LTE, 10, 20% of the gain they expect to get, they'll get. Because it's extremely difficult to do that with OFDMA. Speaker, uh, we need to, this carrying aggregation should go across not only the license bands, but also license exempt bands. So this is one of the distinguishing features of the 5G. There is no separation between uh, licensed and unlicensed bands. Why should there be any separation between the two? I know it has an impact on the business model, but from the technology point of view, I think uh, Jens mentioned that. I think one, your one gigahertz you mentioned includes the unlicensed bands. Spectral energy efficiency, as Chilin mentioned, we do not want energy consumption, power consumption to increase linearly with the traffic growth. We want to break that relationship, at least. I believe that the control from the network control, the way that we have designed 2G, 3G, 4G, has to move and has to shift five minutes here. Yeah. It has to shift some of that control aspects to the device. At the moment, 
the networks are highly centralized and highly central, centrally controlled. When we have a large number of small cells, that control needs to be distributed. And device has very important role to play. For this, we say that some, a Wi-Fi-like light MAC protocol is very important as part of this air interface. And it should be scalable to support low data rate, machine to machine, to high data rate broadband. Not like an add-on feature that what we have done on machine type communication to LTE. So these are some of the areas that would like the researchers to do more research. Infrastructure sharing. I think UK has been pioneering in this area with Telefonica, with T-Mobile and Orange, do the infrastructure sharing. Now, very soon, it's going to be announced, Vodafone and Telefonica will be doing infrastructure sharing. But infrastructure sharing, the way it is done today, it is mainly the asset sharing, the site, base stations, and some of the equipment sharing. If it's done more cleverly, when we have two networks, if they are co-located, the, the cells, we said the difference between them is zero. If the networks are shifted with respect to each other, up to the one cell radius, so we call it R, you simply, with no additional bandwidth, you can get between 10 to 50% increase in the capacity. And in these sort of scenarios, the cell edge disappears. You don't have the cell edge problem. Another important aspect is you get 50-60% energy power efficiency as well. If you do sharing on the call admission level or TTI level or even packet level, but do it more intelligently, not only doing it to minimize the cost of the infrastructure. We need to look at the new architectures, where the base stations cooperate with each other and form a virtual MIMO. What I want to say here, the MIMO system, it actually uses the interference to our own benefit. So I would say in 5G, we should emphasize this more. Interference is a good thing. I know it surprises some people, but that's what MIMO is about. And we should not try to avoid interference, suppress interference, or do anything else, but use that one to our own benefit with what Chilin mentioned about like a CRAN. We need a super receiver in order to turn the all this interference into useful interference. We've done some theoretical capacity limit study using of the interference as well as the signal in the cooperative cells. The capacity we have in LTE is here, two, three. What we could theoretically achieve is up to 24 times. So it's about eight times more. But it allows us to move to different levels of the cell size, cell dimensions as well. So this is the architecture. For example, we are working in 5G Innovation Center that we have this signal of interest. We have in interference from coming from other cells in the joint coordinated and detection virtual MIMO. We can use all of this into much stronger signals and use it as a source of diversity. Anyway, since I got two, two minutes probably by now, or one minute. Energy efficiency. If you break down, this is some of the studies that we've done in the Earth project which Chilin mentioned. The standby mode of the base station uses more energy than what the energy we use for signaling and for the data user. So by separation of data and signaling control channels, physical separation of that, 
and extending that one to the SDN concept that Chile mentioned, to have it end-to-end, -end, fixed network, separation between control and data, as well as extending that to the radio side, we can easily switch on and switch off some of these base stations to get rid of the, the energy wastage, power wastage in a standby mode. We can even do further than that by reducing the energy used because of the signaling in this architecture. To do that even further, minimizing the effect of the signaling, I would like to introduce this concept to you that which I call it memoryful networking. Mobile networks it has evolved since 2G to uh, circuit switch, packet switch, IP, etc. But the way that we do the networking is all is all based on what we did in GSM. If a user has a transaction with a network, network wipes that one off its memory. At the next time, it will do the same things over and over and over again. The problem is when we go to smaller cells, we increase the data capacity per meter squared by going to smaller cells. At the same time, we increase the signaling per meter squared. So we need to separate it, these two from each other to provide us with another degree of freedom in cell dimensioning. Some of the protocols and signaling I've mentioned is referred to layer three. All of this needs to be revisited. And we need to come up with a new signaling architecture. And that's why we say memory full networking. It will save the energy, improves the latency, and is highly spectral efficient as well. We need to look at new metrics. The two figures that Chilean mentioned, 100 megabits per second and 1 gigabit per second, these are obsolete, in my opinion. You look at the energy efficient and area spectral efficiency. We we'll need to look at um, the frequency bands, it's cellular, Wi-Fi, as well as broadband, uh, broadcast bands, services. But there again, broadcast is another issue for another talk some other time. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Harry, Rahim. Uh, any questions? Miku. You mentioned that uh, for looking at the new air interface, this uh, spectrum sensing is important. So how overall do you see the role of spectrum sensing? It's very important. Areas? This is as part of the MAC protocol when we distribute it between the terminal and the network. The device needs to do sensing as well as the base station and both together in order to come up with a new lightweight distributed MAC protocol. And that is across licensed as well as unlicensed bands. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's a lot of words here about capacity, nothing about coverage. Is that because we think that's an irrelevant problem or a not so interesting problem or? About the coverage. coverage. I mean, how do you provide good data rates to everyone, not just in the city centers? I mean, no. I guess a, lo a lot of our base today are not data at all capacity limited. Yeah, data rate that you require for example, if you look at this, sorry, how do I go back? Yeah. If you look at this scenario, the data rate growth in other environment is not as sharp as it is in city, uh, city centers. So it, this considers the capacity or demand increasing in all different environments. But the critical one, the one that is going to hit the wall, is inner cities first. And then it's going to be 
outer cities and uh, and etc etc but yeah, okay so I get the, but a lot a lot of base stations today have to be have to be deployed not because you need the capacity there but this is one solution this is one solution which i think it is not a very clever solution just increasing the data the cell density I think that's a, that's an interesting issue because the, the sort of the question what is coverage has sort of shifted from it's very easy for a mobile in the mobile phone situation what is coverage you can make a phone call but here it depends on the um, the data rate that you want to provide and the the 95% data rate if you want to raise that to a couple of megabits per second or 10 megabits per second then it's has a severe impact on the, the density of and in particular in rural area that's that's a uh, critical issue, I guess. Yes. Lauri. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, just for clarity, so uh, looks like you are proposing this potential 5G to be a um, dense uh, small cell type of system. So, a ad and and then I think that means that LTE would be the wide area solution uh, from now on. Do I get it right? No, half correct. I think the small cells are important, but not to the um, degree that we are talking about 10 times, 100 times, or some people say 50 times or 100 times, etc. But we need to look at the whole overall picture. Some of them, this capacity will be met by small cells, by the, some of them by the cooperation with the small cells, but some advanced issues uh, that I mentioned, some people are doing it by infrastructure sharing, perhaps, and etc. So it's a combination of different technologies, rather than just one way of approaching this high capacity. Whether LT is going to be for microcell, I have no problem with that. But that's what it was designed for. Klaus Beckmann gets the last word. Okay, uh, just for uh, just a small comment here. You 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 said something about Wi-Fi and said it's so patchy at Waterloo Station. But I, my my feeling is that the uh, IEEE organization doesn't just sit home and wait for for the rest of the world to come up with the inventions. And and uh, we just uh, here in Stockholm we have two new modern arenas just newly built the friends arena where you know sweden beat england in football and, <laughs> uh, and during that time when when uh, when slatan did all his goals there were they were in that small arena there were 10000 uh, uh, sessions uh, occurring simultaneously on the wi-fi network which is built by cisco i know and and they have this sort of arena I, and it seems to me that wi-fi is actually doing things they are they are actually working on these issues on high capacity as well so so um, can we really just uh, sort of t turn that option away or or isn't there things happening there as well no, no i mean i'm not saying that you should take that the london 2012 we mainly served by wi-fi but when we have high density of the wi-fi access points close to each other and high number of users within them, the capacity keeps increasing and, and then it starts decreasing mm -hmm. because it's not designed to be a multi-cell and multi-user. Okay, so that's... The, the work has been done in the Wi-Fi IEEE one is just increasing the data rate. But the Mac is a holy grail in IEEE. They don't want to change it. Mm -hmm. And as long as they don't change the Mac, we never get efficient multi-user Wi-Fi system. Mm -hmm. That's why I would say this. Let's design a small cell based on LTE or 5G air interface. We does the same thing as Wi-Fi does, using the analysis band as well as license band. If IEEE is too religious about changing Mac, Mac layer. I think that sounds like an interesting lunch discussion. So I think we, um, unfortunately, we're a little bit late here. So we need to break for lunch right now to thank Rahim once more.